making sense of the world is of course like it's nothing new obviously we've all been doing that as human beings since the beginning of time what's different now is that the world we're trying to make sense of is that orders of complexity higher than it would have been for many of our ancestors who may have met a few hundred people in their lives or known you know some you know say a handful of people intimately etc and of course there was complexity in the world and human relationships are always complex and there was a lot of challenges we've always had to overcome but now in a, in a hyper technological interconnected multicultural intense environment where we consume a huge amount of information and a lot of that information is untrustworthy that's why sense making i think has become so important welcome back to the transmission, my friends. Making sense of the human condition is a extraordinarily complex proposition under the best of circumstances. That's why we spoke about it a couple weeks ago. That's why it's one of the primary philosophical through lines of this entire media vessel. It's a never ending psychological plate spinning act. And of course, the moment you think you've got those plates under control, the multiverse throws another one at you and the whole thing comes crashing down and we have to make sense of the whole equation all over again. And that is why it is such a balm to talk to people like Alexander Biner. He has a tremendously wide breadth of knowledge in philosophy, psychology, sociology, spirituality, and he blends it all together beautifully throughout this mind meld and his new book, The Bigger Picture, How Psychedelics Can Help Us Make Sense of the World. You may also know him as the co-founder of the wonderful channel Rebel Wisdom. He's also an executive director of Breaking Convention in the UK which I would really like to make it to one day. And another incredible angle to Alex and this conversation is that he recently participated in an unbelievably novel study out of Imperial College London that I almost can't believe is even real. You may have heard it mentioned in our episode with Andrew Gallimore a few weeks back, in which they studied the effects of high-dose intravenous DMT for the first time, which, for those who don't know, is essentially one of the most psychoactive molecules known to mankind. And Alex's experiences, as you'll hear, are really something, really quite remarkable. We talk about all of the above and more in this mind meld. I'm not even gonna try to encapsulate it. I'm just gonna say that this is quintessential third eye drops fair, this kind of freewheeling, open-ended, philosophical exploration that we do in this episode. So with that, my friends, let's get into it. All of the portals you will need for Alex and his writings and his book are in the description, as are all of the necessary keyboard mudras for third eye drops. Speaking of which, do be sure to tickle that algorithm with a like and a sub. And do subscribe to Third Eye Drops wherever you listen to podcasts because we've got over 300 episodes that are audio only that shall never incarnate in the YouTube realm. And I hope you will also consider supporting these transmissions at patreon.com forward slash third eye drops where you will not only support us but join a community. You'll be able to participate in calls with myself and other guests you've heard on the show. Join a patron only Discord book club get rewards like stickers, pins, shirts, and more. And with that, my friends, let's meld minds with the wonderful, wise Alexander Biner. Wonderful to be in the space with you, man. It was really a pleasure uh, getting to connect with you at Psychedelic Science a couple weeks ago. Um, and even more of a pleasure to connect with you now after I've digested a bit of your book because like in a lot of ways, I feel like if you're interested in these big questions, you're interested in philosophy, you're interested in exploring the mind, all of these questions you get into in the book are inevitably things that come up, but are to me, they seem like they'd be very difficult to wrap within the confines of a book. But you managed to do it, I think, in a really sensical well laid out way. And that's so hard to do, man, to take to take these ideas that might seem far flung and just make them seem intimately related. I'm, I'm like, I'm really impressed by it, man. You did a great oh, job. Man, thank you. Firstly, yeah. Th firstly, massive thank you for that. And I'm really glad you're enjoying it. And then also thank you for having me on. Uh, yeah, likewise, it was really fun to connect it 
at Psychedelic Science. Uh, I've, I've been uh, following you on Instagram for a while and um, listening to some of your stuff. And so, yeah, it's, just, it's nice to be here together and um, see see where the conversation takes us. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of of like and like that are going to come together in this sort of a psychic collision. And um, man, I was saying we I think we might need to do a little bit of foreplay before getting into what we were just talking about before the recording. And now I'm like, man, what what is the proper foreplay for some, for something like that? But I, I think I think maybe maybe the way that we can orient the conversation is that there's been for the past few years now the emergence of what's largely been called the kind of you know sense making community or or sense making angle and it's never gone away it's it's been pretty steady for a few years and you you had a really large part i think in playing how that emerged to begin with, with what you were doing on Rebel Wisdom and et cetera. And yeah, maybe we should maybe we should summarize what that is. And then I kind of have some some thoughts on like, where is it now? Because it, in a lot of ways, it, it, it has this very zoomed out perspective. But then I think now I think we've like We've entered a new, we, we've broken through a new atmosphere in whatever that effort is, I think. Um, but yeah, I'll stop babbling and let you. Yeah, yeah. And I'm also really, now super curious about breaking into the new atmosphere. And I want to put a flag in and, and come back to that and maybe try and end on that because um, on yeah. this bit right now, because that's that's kind of a cool thought. So yeah, sense making. Um, I've kind of a love hate relationship with the word sense making, even though, as you mentioned, like, yeah, at, at Rebel Wisdom, which if people aren't aware of, it was a, a kind of alternative media platform, which was really based around this, this concept. We were trying to figure out what is going on. That's, that's kind of what sense making is, right? It goes a bit deeper than that, but it's a bit, it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, often we would, the reason I have this love hate relationship is because I'm like, uh, it sounds kind of like up itself and like fancy way of saying, like figuring out what's going on. But I haven't yeah. been able to find a better word for it. So I've, I've stuck with it. And like, you know, making sense of the world is, um, is of course, like it's nothing new. Obviously, we've all been doing that as human beings since the beginning of time. What's different now is that the world we're trying to make sense of is that orders of complexity higher than it would have been for many of our ancestors who may have, you know, let's say, met a few hundred people in their lives or known, you know, some, you know, say a handful of people intimately been in largely same environments, might've been nomadic, etc. And of course there was complexity in the world and human relationships are always complex. And there was a lot of challenges we've always had to overcome, but now in a, in a hyper technological interconnected, multicultural, intense environment where we consume a huge amount of information. And a lot of that information is untrustworthy that's why sense making, I think, has become so important, because, and especially during COVID, where people are trying to figure out what's going on, what's the right thing to do. Does my government have the right approach to this, or is this all, you know, whatever? Um, and of course, bad sense making gets us into um, kind of really narrow frames of reference and a really narrow sort of like, you know, we might become fixated on an ideology. Or conspiracy theory that, that kind of explains everything. And that's not to say that there aren't conspiracies or collusions in, in, in our structures, but more this kind of like mythic kind of conspiracy that that kind of yeah. explains the whole world. Um, and also, just you know, this is you know insight from Buddhism and many other practices that like we are kind of self-deceptive, and this is something that uh, John Verveke, cognitive yeah. scientist, points to, and, and many psychologists like we are just totally full of it and <laughs> and so you know one of the things i mentioned john riveki i mentioned him in the book a fair amount like his work was really influential on me because he he has this uh, youtube series called awakening from the meaning crisis which kind of hit hit yeah. the scene it's like 50 hours long it's really deep it's really good i haven't seen all 50 episodes but i met someone who's seen them all twice which i thought was kind of out there um but good on him um but you know riveki's whole work is kind of based around this idea that like intelligence is bias so in a way it's impossible wow. not to be biased because what what our intelligence is is taking in all this information and deciding what's relevant because it relevance realization so from everything that's yeah. salient to you 
Um, so calling for your attention, how do you, the way that you figure out what's relevant to who you are and what your goals are and where you're going, that is intelligence. So, yeah. so we can't not be biased because we're always biased in some way. So that makes it just really hard to figure out what's going on. Because if I want to go, if I want to figure out what's happening in, U- in Ukraine right now, I'm like, okay, how am I going to do that? I've got the mainstream news and then, you know, I might go and l- look at loads of Twitter, um, sort of feeds of sort of military experts who are putting stuff out, but then, you know, that could be counter information that could be, it, it's, there's so much, it's a kind of a minefield. Yeah. So, so that kind of fun process of figuring out, okay, how do we get better at making sense of what's going on? And how do we actually bring in ancient wisdom traditions and modern psychology together? That was a big focus of, of, of rebel wisdom. And it's also quite a big focus of, uh, of my book, the bigger picture, because I think psychedelics are so well placed to help us make sense of what's going on in a really psychedelic, crazy, complex time. Yeah, man. Yeah, you you bring up elements of of this whole conversation that I wasn't even thinking of, particularly the angle of us being kind of fundamentally self-deceptive creatures and that we need to realize that about ourselves. We need to realize that our that our intuitions are going to rather our bias is going to masquerade as intuition like like that that's something i've noticed so much is that what people call intuition is actually like a weird complex form of bias that's really just their their physiology their ego coercing them into making a decision that they think is intuitive but really is just r- riddled with with bias and, and and that's a whole that's a whole other element to it and then you know, there's there's one of the elements we we didn't even bring up yet is that we're not starting from any kind of solid ground when it comes to this effort of sense making. When it comes to this effort of like, okay, well, we all believe in X ontological principle. At least we can all start there. Like we don't even have that anymore because we don't have any kind of collective ground that we're springing off of. I think that that leads to this really strange phenomenon that in a lot of ways was probably inevitable with just the convergence of humanity, um, you know, cultures clashing and creating some sort of like epistemological kerfuffle. Like this is is Mm -hmm. always going to happen at some point, I think. Like you can, you, you can sort of like read the tea leaves in a lot of ways, I think, at least from a, hindsight is 2020 kind of perspective. And then that leads to, I think, your point about how psychedelics could be a catalyst for reaching not not some kind of a, like single agreed upon ontological idea even, but perhaps as you talk about in the book, like widen the frame or break the frame enough to understand that the universe, life, the, the the mysterium tremendum it's bigger than we can understand it's bigger than our ideologies allow for it's bigger than our political affiliations races all of these things allow for so we need to be a bit less rigid and just open ourselves up to new ideas to new possibilities and i don't know if that will be enough but i'm hoping it's enough to like to shake off some of the psychic calcification yeah, yeah, that's uh, there's so many things I want to pick up on there. I mean, the, you're you're absolutely right in my opinion about this lack of a foundation, certainly in yeah. Western culture, um, of yeah, lack of an ontological foundation, and la- really not really a firm sense of what reality is to begin with, because we have this this scientific, um, perhaps not scientific, we have this materialist in the philosophical sense. Um, which I refer to as like physicalism in the book, um, Mm -hmm. which is uh, also another name for it. But this, this idea that, okay, the only thing that's real is stuff matter. That's the only thing that's real. And in fact, human consciousness or consciousness in general is a byproduct of that. And so there's not really any meaning in that because it's just this kind of dead cold. We're all this part of this dead cold machine of a universe. Now, generally when people take, not always, but generally Frequently, when people have a psychedelic experience, they come to a, a sense that the world is alive, and conscious in some way, and and thriving and, and mysterious. Like you know, and I totally agree. I don't think it. 
I think the time is done where we're going to like find a big new story, ontological story that we're all in a very multicultural world, loads of different people, of different perspectives going to be all like, yeah, I'm down with that story. Um, but something, a connection to something greater than ourselves is, I think, fundamentally essential for human beings not to go insane. Um, and what yeah. we've seen in the last uh, 50 years or perhaps more, probably like kind of a story of the 20th century was a, a kind of fragmentation of certainties. And that kind of, that happened through modernism. So after the first world war, when everyone started thinking, oh crap, maybe this whole story of our culture and these grand nations and this kind of certainty, maybe it's not so certain after all. And so artists and, and philosophers started kind of, playing with that and it was kind of a dull fragmentation like people were bummed mm. out about it basically it was like everything is we just got through this horrific trauma of world war one and then we had postmodernism. yeah later on which was really much more of a playing with that and this idea which we still have and is really fundamental in culture which is that there is no fixed truth everything is relative there's mm. only relative truths and everything is constructed by language and so that i think there is some truth to that. The idea that things are socially constructed is like a lot of the time a quite useful and accurate way of seeing the world, but you can't have, you can't deconstruct culture and reality without having a deeper reality to deconstruct it into. Yes, Otherwise yes, you yes, just yes. have total chaos. And it's just like, um, I talk about it uh, briefly in the book, like you, you lose what's, what's called a sense of coherence, which is uh, fundamental for the sense of connectedness to the world and well being. Um, everything's upside down, topsy turvy. Nothing really makes sense. That's kind of what the internet's like a little bit as well. Oh yeah. Um, that's so increasingly we live in a world that's that's defined like that. Um, and but you know the answer, you know you'll you'll get various different tribes and culture. Like you get more conservative tribes who are like, right, the answer is to go back to a traditionalism where where things made sense. And it's right. like, yeah, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. And I don't think personally that's desirable because a lot of people were completely left out of the social contract at that time so that's where the critique right of, right the progressive critique is really spot on it's like yeah it was really great for some people mainly white people um and it was pretty crappy for everyone else so we don't actually want to go back to that but also we we need some kind of foundational certainty of what we're living for and that's what's referred to as the meaning crisis which is um kind of pretty fundamental and pretty important in terms of psychedelics because most cultures that have used psychedelics uh, for a long time have a cosmology that they fit into. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a, we have many cosmologies. It's more like the tower of Babel in the Bible. We've got like, Oh yeah. Good point. Every one of their dog has a cosmology for, <laughs> for psychedelics. So that's a really tricky situation. It really is, man. It really is. And I think, you know, it's a sort of belabor. Maybe this is a really belaboring the, the conversation about postmodernism, but just to highlight what I think the problem with it is, is that when you make everything relative, when you make everything just a, you know, a little, a little aesthetic flash in the pan of each culture, like, oh, this is the way they did it. And this is the way they did it. Therefore, you get to this place where everything is equally both valid and invalid and relative. <laughs> and when you live in that kind of a worldview, you can then parlay that into, so my way of life is fully my choice and equal to all of the ways that came before. And there's tremendous hubris in that, first of all. But second of all, it, it leads to throwing away, I think, a lot of really fundamental wisdom that comes from ancient times and comes from other ways of life now, where you can sort of just you can just sort of you have this like infinite get out of jail free card culturally and ideologically if you think that way right and if you do that i think you're you're kind of doomed i think and you're kind of doomed to living in a world that is like ha has this meaning crisis embedded into it because then again there is no solid ground right there is no foundation it's all relative it's just a bunch of like juggles being <laughs> balls being juggled by by the trickster or something like that and but then i guess maybe that's your maybe that's your your ground is the the, the infinite multi-faced trickster being that ex expresses itself through through all different cultures or something but um 
I really think that the antidote to that is what you were talking about, like co coming to some sort of not foundational ontological conclusion, because I don't think it's knowable, mm -hmm. but uh, like a, a situ a situation, a situation ship, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you know like, like be, being yeah. not not in like a not in like a committed relationship, but but a situation ship in that even if we're not going to marry the idea of there being some transcendent reality that we all spring out from and return to in a kind of perennial philosophy sort of way we should operate as if that's the case regardless because i think it would lead to a better world and 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 at least a somewhat resacralized way of of looking at life yeah yeah, I think that's spot on. I mean, there's that, that's, uh, I had such a vivid image come up of that trickster that, you know, because in a way I do kind of interpret the universe oh, yeah. somewhat having that trickster quality. It's this beautiful sort of, uh, universe tricking itself in some way. Um, and you know, there, there's, there's this deep, you know, in my view, there's this deep void at the heart of modern life, which is the sacred, which, which doesn't have to be religious in, in a sense, but it's, in some schools of sociology, the, the sacred is just what do you we hold as above the social game? Like what's more important than your job? What's more important than like status and money? Yeah. And we have, you know, like Durkheim and others, sociologists argued like the sacred, even in a non-religious society, the sacred is everywhere. You can't escape it. Humans make something sacred and something's yeah. profane. So, you know, like human life is sacred for most cultures. Um, and uh, so is, um, you know, sports teams are sacred for, for some of us right like yeah. they're kind of like kind of like at a higher order um so i think we need the sacred because otherwise we get so narcissistic as a culture we just become completely self-obsessed there's nothing beyond the culture itself um and we also need there's this idea of um enabling constraints which is in some like systems thoughts which is this idea that like by and by like preventing yourself from being able to do something you you deepen like the, you kind of get a deeper experience of life and you, you um, basically open up new possibilities. Like for example, if you get married, you're, it's an enabling constraint. You're like, okay, I'm constraining right. myself from being with other people. But what I get in return for that is this deep, deep connection that I couldn't get if I was just going around having sex with whoever I wanted and having shallow relationships, etc. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, um, there's this sort of <laughs> it's like a trope of hippie parenting, right? Which which is like, you know, like the kids are free and wild and do whatever they want. And that's really, there is something really beautiful about that, right? There's something really lovely about that. And then there's also this element of not having any boundaries or having right. any constraints isn't actually very good for human beings. Yeah. Um, and it creates selfishness. Um, so somehow finding a balance that between freedom and constraint, because you don't want like, you know, or I don't want like a super traditionalist model where it's like, okay, we're all going to get married and be, and go to the suburbs and just have regular, normal, <laughs> constrained right, lives. Right, right. Cause that's also fucking, that's horrific after a while. Right. It's so like stifling. And then that, you know, then of course in the fifties, that was partly what the reaction of the youth was to, to the culture. It was meaningless and stifling and like the, 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 the and it was also, also, you know, crucially, um, uh, in incredibly racist. <laughs> and then also, uh, there was a war in Vietnam, which was basically the culture being like, yeah, we're the bad guys now. And then the young people, you know, so psychedelics uh, have, have this kind of connection to that somewhat revolutionary countercultural spirit, even though it can also, because we're human beings, go completely the wrong way. So, so that's another thing I've been really, curious about and focused on not just in the book but certainly in the book but also over the last few years of like okay what is a what does a new psychedelic counterculture look like like yeah. a healthy one that that's got like that can like embrace the complexity of the 2020s instead of the 1960s which were a completely different time mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah that that reminds me you bring up this astute observation in the book to the point of of what we were just um speaking around which is that it's almost the new punk rock thing to do, the new countercultural thing to do to leave the city and return to that 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 sort of 1950s white picket fence nuclear family way of life. And then you you almost get these like anthropomorphized like archons of that 
way of thinking like Jordan Peterson's, you know, talking about the, you know, the pitfalls of, you know, postmodern is post. <laughs> it's not good. All right. It's not good. Um, I swear my Jordan Peterson impression is usually better than that. But it's, I, it's I, very good. I, man. I fumbled it. Good. I fumbled it right off the right off the line and and I couldn't pick it back up back up. But I was pretty impressed. <laughs> but um, but yeah, and, and it's not that there's not wisdom in those observations it's that to your point just like most people don't want to go back to a fully entrenched shamanistic way of being where they're divorcing technology and becoming a psychedelic luddite or whatever they also don't quite feel like that's the right way for them either like going back to that that way of life seems to be missing something that's emergent and being birthed right now Th this new dialectical thing that's that's coming out of whatever our our time is and i think we're starting to be able to see some of the raw ingredients of whatever that dialectical emergence is mm -hmm. like clearly psychedelics is one clearly this mm -hmm. technological innovation with with ai and crypto and web three, whatever that ends up being. Um, clearly all of these things are involved. And clearly also the, you know, the McKennian sort of um archaic revival, our 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 interest in these ancient sources of wisdom is also part of it. And and what that all becomes cohesive into what what that new cultural object is that we'll be looking back on in a hundred years with the postmodern perspective and like understanding it as a fully formed cultural object i don't know but i'm very curious what you think it could look like or sh you hope it looks like kind of combining these ingredients that are inevitably going to collide and and, and they're gonna they're gonna form some kind of dish you know yeah, and, and and what yeah. kind of dish that is could definitely be acrid from where I'm sitting, but it could also be, it could be, there, there are paths to deliciousness yeah. as well, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, nicely said. Um, yeah. I mean, my short answer is I don't know because it feels so, it feels like you said, I agree with you. Like I think some, there's a kind of, well, there's always something emerging, but there is some, there is a shift happening, I think, away from, I feel like after 2016, the election of sort of Trump and Brexit and these like mm -hmm. big shocks mm -hmm. to the system. And then we had the invasion of, Ukraine, which kind of in, in some ways didn't reestablish, but certainly strengthened the old global order of sort of like yeah. NATO. And like, so that yeah. there's been a lot of, it's been a weird decade. I mean, it was, it was really quite intense as we all know. Um, and there was there, it feels like we're in this kind of in between period right now yes. where we're waiting to see what's going to happen because also none of the problems, none of the deeper socioeconomic disenfranchisement and problems um, that existed in 2016 that led to the election of Trump and this big fuck you to the system. Um, none of those have been resolved, you know, and, and progressive culture didn't really like meet its critiques and go, yeah, actually this is an elitist um, endeavor that isn't really meeting the needs of others uh, in the society. And that's a great tragedy because it, it should have, that's what, you know, we're all human and we all need to be heard. And so that is, something I track constantly because I write about this kind of stuff and I'm like, Oh yeah. I feel like next year with the election, it's going to get, it's, it's going to be chaotic and unpredictable, yeah, right? So whatever happens, I have no idea. Yeah. Now what I would like to see is there's also a whole bunch of people who are interested in some kind of new paradigm that before was way more fringe. And now I see more and more people interested in it. I think psychedelics probably help, you know, the mainstreaming of psychedelics helps in that, it's fraught with pitfalls as well, which we can we can talk about. Um, but the what I would hope is that we actually make a move towards something more human and authentic. You know, we have all this technology that's sort of taking us out of our bodies, mm -hmm. away from ourselves, away from connection. And then we have we also have communities who are very into raving and movement and practices yeah. like you know my, psychedelic meditation. The, however. In those communities as well, I think there really needs to be a grappling with politics in a new way, because what's mm. happening is like, you know, for example, I'm going to do a workshop at Boom Festival, which is in a couple of weeks, because um, they specifically asked me to 
and this is going to be wild. I don't know how it's going to go, but they were like, look, we've got a lot of like boom is like super conscious people, quite yeah. sort of eco aware. It's like, if people don't know it, it's like kind of the burning man of Europe. Um, and so, but they've got all these tensions that are cultural tensions within the boom community, like sure. around pronouns, around gender, around um, racial issues and around like, especially this idea of all is one. And then, so why do we need to be like treating different races differently? So that, so in a sense, they're kind of like also yeah. ignoring people's lived experience, but also they're bringing also an important perspective. So what generally happens is that the conversation just breaks down and people just at each other's throats, yeah. which is happening everywhere. You it's know, like a micro, it's media. like a microcosm of the sense making issue in real exactly. time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, what I'm going to be trying to do is, is something I did a lot at Rebel Wisdom, which is um, kind of teaching the skills and techniques of, yeah, I mean, also just basic self-regulation and, and inner curiosity to just be human and speak about these issues from a human level. Because what I found is that the ideologic, the ideologies and political ideas, um, A, we are often carriers of them and we didn't develop them ourselves. Right, so we're just right. spouting someone else's. Um, and also it's not really about or let's say very often it's not about the idea itself. It's about the human emotion that's unexpressed or unsolved. So it's about being seen, being heard. And when we get into that place, the whole conversation shifts. So that's kind of a microcosm of the kind of process I would love to see happen in culture more widely, where we actually start having real conversations. There's a much more compassionate meeting of complexity. That's the main, like I was yeah. just writing something today and I, I talk a lot about why understanding complexity is so important in the book. But I was like, um, yeah, I was like, yeah, I would like to see a complexity culture. Is um, it sounded kind of cheesy, so I didn't put it in the piece. But like that, <laughs> like that's kind of what I'd like to see. It's like a culture where ev everyone is educated into like, look, there are no black and white answers. Some things, are, some things as a culture yeah. can be black and white. Like you know, don't don't kill children. We're like, yeah, right, okay, right, that's right. pretty black and white, right? But very often we're like, okay, we have to grapple with the complexity without also falling into some weird mushy gray area where everyone's just right all the time just because they yeah. express something, right? So there's just a whole new way I think we need to learn how to relate to each other as human beings. hundred percent. That we're just not taught. And but yeah. we can we can learn it. We can totally learn it. It's just it's learnable. It's just that um you know we change when we have to, when when the conditions force us to because we're um you know, on some level, all of us kind of lazy and we don't want to change unless we have to. Um, right. That's that kind of pretty universal human thing. And also we're, we're also amazing and, you know, dedicated. And so, so I think, uh, yeah, that, that's my deep hope is that it just gets more human because it feels very inhuman the way we now interact with each other on, on social media. Um, and just this disconnection, I think disconnection is a huge theme in the culture. Like movies are crap. And disconnected and aren't speaking to something deeper not all movies there's a lot of great indie movies and stuff but if you just like watch like what's being churned out by disney and like marvel it's kind of repetitive sort right, of like right. profit driven like yeah gross where you're like oh god yeah um becoming a that, slave to their own tropes and, and yeah, captured yeah, by the exactly. audience and just having to keep the machine going at this point it's like losing yeah. that whatever that spark was that seemed so yeah. fresh at the time for sure yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that that's my hope. That's my hope. And I do think it's I do think it's possible. I just think it's going to require a big reevaluation of what we value. Yeah. No, I I think you're really onto something with this complexity culture. I don't I don't think it's bad at all. I, I kind of like the the alliteration. But um but man, that reminds me of are, are you familiar with the the psychologist James Hillman? Uh, vaguely, I know the name, but I'm not so familiar with his work. So he, a lot of people consider him a post Jungian, but uh, he wrote a best-selling book called Soul's Code and just just a really a really brilliant guy, one of my favorite um kind of post-Jungian thinkers for sure. And his son, um, Lawrence Hillman, is also just this brilliant guy, psychology PhD, became interested in archetypes for obvious reasons from a very young age, became interested in astrology and art and myth from a very young age, and learned myth and astrology at like the age of like 15 or something. So he's just gone through his entire life, both being the son of this man. So he was just like marinated in archetypal psychological <laughs> thinking from that perspective, and then going his own way for, you know, I think he's like 60 now. And he said the same thing to me in a diff in a different kind of language in that he was saying that we we now live in a time where I'm, I don't remember his words exactly, where 
if if you were going to visualize what the social fabric of our time now it's it's no longer like a like a an object it's like a blown apart decentralized network of thinking and ideas where nobody wants to be told what to do how to think anymore mm -hmm. and this is also um archetypally speaking you know the the emergence of the aquarian which is like the the the, the freer flowing more kind of like um you know loose loose yeah. way of of associating and identifying sort of um psychic atmosphere and we kind of just have to get used to that being reality and i think the way that you're putting it is kind of a more down to earth way of saying the same thing is that this is the emerging energy of the age and it seems like we can't escape that reality and if you're if you're fighting against that current you're you're just you're swimming upstream against a tsunami essentially and and i think there's so many in motion um factors in this change. I mean, we are going to have to blow our frames of reference apart for other emerging technologies that we've already mentioned, like AI, like psychedelics. All of these things are like, we we can't predict what these things are going to do and then throw aliens on top of it and then throw mm -hmm. putting microchips in your brain on top of it. And, you know, just, and, and it just, it just keeps coming and keeps coming. And, you know, you, you mentioned, this is something I really wanted to talk about, the, the sense that we're living in an in between time, you know, like a lot of people talk about this, that we're in some kind of liminal zone. You know, Charles Eisenstein talks about this. A, a lot, a lot of folks talk about this. But I think there's immense wisdom in realizing that we're we're always in some kind of every or uh, in between time, and the only time there's a sense of collective sighing in like we've arrived somewhere is after some kind of tremendous collective upheaval it, that that sort of serves as a kind of psychical birth of something and and that that's and that's like in in the best of times it's a breakthrough or a revolution and in the worst of times it's like a cataclysmic war as you pointed to in the wake of world war one or something and i'm not sure if it has to be that way but i don't know if there is another way. So my point with this rant is that I think if we got more comfortable in the in-between, in mm -hmm. realizing, I think James Hollis, another awesome post-Jungian thinker, said this, that life is just a series of passages. It's like you think you're going to get through one and then I'm there. Nope, there's another one, there's another one. Or, you know, this sort of ouroboric image of just like, Oh look, I'm I'm getting I'm getting I'm finally getting to the the target I've been chasing, and then the whole thing just starts all over again under slightly different circumstances or something. There's a lot of wisdom I think in seeing the world more in that way, but getting people to not just be comfortable with that idea, but also find it kind of sexy, and mm. that in in that it's like a oh. I'm living in a constantly expanding open world RPG with like new new updates, you know, <laughs> like, like the, oh, there's an AI update now. There's an alien update now. And I realize it's not kind of like trivializing life in, in a way, but I don't know. There, there's something maybe instead of a, a sense of making, it's like adventure making out of <laughs> out, out of yeah, the yeah. out of the mystery or something. Yeah, I love that. I love that. You know, it makes, makes me think about yeah, I think I, I yeah I, I think that you're definitely onto something there. You know, the looking at the internet in particular, which is where we spend a ton of our time now. Yeah. You know, I make this I make this argument in the book um, that actually I made in an essay a few years ago called "The Age of Breach." That, that there's this uh, um, concept that kind of comes from Sufism, but uh i think it may be in some other traditions called the imaginal right this sort of like world between the physical and and the kind of spiritual this kind of like this kind of world between worlds right and it kind of suffuses the real world and i think the the internet in some ways like our imaginal right it's this kind of it's between our minds and the real world but it's this kind of own entity and it is you know i also may make the argument that that it's effectively a kind of a mechanical unconscious. And I've spoken mm. to a few Jungian who were like, it's not a real unconscious. It's not the collective unconscious, but it's a kind of like version of it. But I actually, you know, I think it's kind of a little bit splitting hairs in a sense. 
all of our psychic energy is going into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's, it's full of memes. You know, there's a guy, Chris Gabriel. I don't know if you come across him who has a YouTube channel called meme analysis. And his I, heard, whole, I heard you mention him on the book. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's awesome. Like his whole, um, premise is like memes are archetypes, right? So memes are the new archetypes that's, or, or not the new archetypes. They are just archetypal expressions. Basically. Yes. Yes. Uh, that, that makes yeah. more sense. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. the archetypes are the archetypes. Right. Um, and so, so he, so in a, in a way, it's not quite like the unconscious, you know, as I'm, as I'm thinking about it, like, and, and I, it is a mechanical unconscious. It's different, right? But it's got, it plays, it sometimes behaves in the similar ways, right? So we yeah. get, for example, these deep sort of semi-religious churnings um, online and like, you know, QAnon was one that then erupted into mm -hmm. January 6th. There's obviously other factors. Um, the GameStop, um, uh, activism, yeah. if people remember that, of you yeah. know, activist investors on Reddit, that also had that feeling to it as well. Um, there's there's a bunch of other examples where you get this kind of like collection of psychic energy that that builds online, and it's totally. all symbolic. It's all through language. It's all through imagery. People posting gifts, and like it just churns away, and then it breaches the real world. But then what happens is that it can't survive in the real world, right? It's yes. kind of fragile. And, you know, uh, you know, I have this great, I'm so happy I found this in the podcast. One of Guy Reffitt, who was one of the ringleaders of January 6th, the insurrection, he was saying to this reporter from his prison cell, he was like, you know, fantasy crashed into reality like a car wreck, Ooh. you know, when they were actually That's standing in the Capitol. Moment. Yeah. And they were like, you know, because they'd been in this immersed in this sort of psychic realm of symbolism and like deep myth. They thought they were in a big mythic quest to yeah. free the world from, from evil satanic pedophiles and the and only they difference really is that if they didn't win because if they would have won <laughs> yeah. their, their myth would have been you know like that's that's spot yeah. on man yeah, yeah that's absolutely true and so this we live in a in a time of sort of deep fantasy in a lot of ways yeah and it the internet enhances that you know it doesn't just have to happen online because also putin was really immersed you know isolated and immersed in this kind of russian fascistic propaganda which also had this mythic quality of like the destiny of mother russia so yeah. he wasn't absorbing it online but he was absorbing the ideas through other people and then gets into this like then it's a, there's another breach moment where he's like yeah. oh, i'm gonna take over and, oh crap i've just fucked my entire country and yes. somebody else's country more importantly so yes. so i think we kind of live in this age where that and i i think part of the reason um Actually, in the original essay I wrote about this, I, I was using the work of a guy called Michael Washburn. Have you ever come across him? No, um, I haven't. Mm -hmm. Talks about um, the ego and the dynamic ground is his his book, where he's it's kind of a Jungian guy, but he, he's talking about um, the way that regression can be in service of transcendence. So we can, we go to these like regressed, almost childlike fantasy spaces, but actually they mm. they can, in some way, then psychologically be moving us towards a transcendence i haven't seen the transcendence yeah. yet but i really like the idea of it um totally. and he also talks about the the repression barrier so that's when, when the repression barrier is breached you know that's kind of why it was part of the part of the inspiration for it yeah so yeah my point being basically we live in mythic mythic times and the internet is a mythic place um yes. and mostly when we're looking at something like ai we're not looking at it in those terms we're looking at it in terms of um you know, what jobs it's going to take or, or is it going to kill us all? Which is also a super important question. <laughs> it's not either right, or, right, but, right. but what we're not looking at and what I'm very interested in, particularly because it overlaps with psychedelics so much is how do we actually engage with the weirdness and the mythic and the psychic power of encountering another entity that's seemingly intelligent? Uh, how do we do that? Well, like psychedelics give us the perfect training ground to do that. That's, you know, that they help us do that all the time. We bow down, we bend over, we say, please, please take me gently because, you know, now, so, so speaking, speaking of breaking through, uh, boundaries and other double entendres, like the foreplay that I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, <laughs> I think we're through that phase of this mind mill now, and we can move awesome. into w what we were just talking about before we were recording, which we is can like, get weird. Yeah. yes. And, and I've been, I've been like, I was getting excited, man. When, when I was, when I was listening to the book this morning and also having this epiphany which we are walking squarely into right now which is that 
your observation about the internet essentially being a playground for archetypes is the way that I, I would put it is uh, that's an epiphany in and of itself. But I think it goes even further in that the human mind has always been like the primary playground for archetypes. And now mm. we're just seeing that exploded out into a piece of technology. And then I started thinking about, so so in the book, what, what made me start thinking about this is you talk about psychedelic entity encounters, like your own encounters in uh, the DMT experiment that you are a participant in, which we also have to talk about directly because it's unbelievably fascinating. Um, the internet and how pieces of technology are almost like archetypal intelligences in and of themselves. Um, and then there's there's an there's another piece to it that I'm oh and and just Jungian archetypes in general and sort of sort of again juggling those three balls without you do kind of directly connect them but also keep a little bit of of distance from from my from my understanding of how I was consuming that part of the book. But there's this really inconvenient thing that's right in front of our faces when we mm. when we we look at these phenomena. And the the inconvenient way, at least for most people who who are allergic to to a kind of fatalism or determinism, is that all of these things are the puppet strings of archetypes. Like we we mm. think we're making technology, yeah. but but look at what technology is doing. I mean, it's it's serving these arch archetypal functions. And 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 in, in some ways it's like very simple to see, right? Like you could see a gun as a archetypal manifestation of Aries Mars energy, right? Like you could see that simple. But then what what happens when you start making these incredibly complex ecosystems that the mind projects itself onto? And then via that vector, that also gives archetypes a way to play in this realm. And first of all, we don't have we don't have very good control or understanding under our own uh, consciousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're just blasting our our very rough understanding of how to pilot this incredibly complex psyche that we have that we're almost exclusively operating on just the egoic level. And we're just pouring that into these unbelievably sophisticated, complex interaction-based technologies like the internet. And then again, the novel emergence of neural networks that literally try to mirror the way a human brain learns and riffs and gains emergent intelligences. Um, and by the way, I think this is happening. I read a paper on... ChatGPT version four when it came out by some engineers and they, you know, they're playing with the fully unlocked version of GPT four, which we don't have access to. Mm -hmm. And they were saying this thing's gaining emergent capabilities already. And they give all these examples of, we don't know why it knows how to do this. We don't know why it knows how to do this. And it's been a while since I read it. So I can't think of specifically um, what those examples were, but to me, it seems like we're seeing archetypes run amok, not only through the human mind and through our political machinations and power dynamics and stuff like that, like they always have, but now they're running amok on the internet. And 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 to your point too, the guy that you mentioned, I, I think that's an astute observation that I think the reason a meme hits is because it's it's speaking to something archetypal. Yeah. It's like it's like yeah. some somebody figured out how to capture something archetypally true about the human experience in in a silly little you know emanation, and it just no one needs to read the directions. It just works, you know. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I, that that idea that archetypes are not inventions of the human mind, but turning that inside out on itself, or at least considering that idea, mm -hmm. uh, it it inductively makes to me in an inconvenient amount of sense like like that that felt like kind of a personal epiphany when i when i thought about that this morning oh that's awesome man like yeah and also for, for me it gives me a new a new lens on it as well about you know this idea a bit like with plants you know michael Pollan and, and others have, have and terence mckenna used to talk about this as well it's like plants use us to move their seeds around instead of us 
you know, yeah. planting plants and like, look which ones are successful, etc. cetera. Um, the idea of us being vectors for, for, for archetypes through technology, I mean, it scans with me, right? Like it's because also there's this kind of uncanny quality of weirdness, intensity, and also most importantly, teleology, like a directedness yeah. and a seeming intention to it, which is pretty wild. And also, you know, on the AI point, like this is an area that I've been writing about a lot recently and like, you know, going back and forth, different people's papers about like, oh, it's got emerging qualities. It doesn't, it does, it doesn't. I'm like, do you know what? Like it doesn't really matter because what it matters in terms, I mean, it matters on one level, but in terms of human psychology and in terms of how things are actually going to pan out um, in, in the in the sphere of, of our interconnectedness and our, and our kind of psyches, it's the experience of interacting with it and each other through it that really matters. So it's like, okay, is this a real, it's a similar with DMT. It's like, is this a real entity that I'm encountering? Right. Is it archetypal? Is it a separated off part of myself? Is it independently arising? And I has nothing to do with my perception of it. I'm encountering another, like all of the, you have to hold all of those things. I think to stay sane in the DMT space, you have to hold all of those possibilities at once and not yeah. collapse your, your, your opinion into any of them because you're just it's not going to work um and so i think it's similar with ai it's like okay what 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 i can say for sure is i'm having the experience of interacting with something that feels real and conscious that right. would be the, the limit of what you could say um but you know also later in the book i also do talk at at length about um panpsychism and idealism and i had a great conversation with bernardo castrep who's probably yeah. the most famous living idealist and he is also a a Jungian. I don't know. Maybe you've had him on the show before. I have. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, his, his take on he's it's, it's a great combination of it is. like skill sets to have. And he was talking about how, um, I was asking him about entities and he was like, look, well, the, I, you know, the archetypes really should be arising in each level of consciousness because if there's a mind at large, and everything yeah. is conscious, then that's going to be. So then if you smoke DMT, you're going to have archetypal encounters. Now, I don't know if they're just archetypal encounters. I haven't made my mind up, but they sometimes feel like that. And they sometimes don't, you know, but, but yeah. Jung did say there are as many different archetypes as there are oh, yeah. varieties of human experience. So it's like, yeah, I mean, yeah. And I, I also think the, it's maybe jumping ahead into talking about entities, but I do think the way that we see entities, the, the, the form they take is pretty culturally, um, condition and also just like very individual um you know i read a lot of sci-fi and my experience is super sci-fi but i think mm. if i read a lot of fantasy maybe it would have been a little bit more lord of the rings i think uh also the setting of the trial i was on was, was very sci-fi whereas my ayahuasca experiences the entity encounters have been different and, mm. and more natural world ish although also sci-fi at times so there's that whole question there's a whole massive open question um about how do we actually increasingly and as in already it's happening but i think even this time next year it's going to be even wilder it's like yeah. i don't know if i'm talking to i'm not i won't be able to tell if i'm talking to you know there could even be experiences like this where you know one of us is an ai you know not sure. so long from now where we're deep faked and we're absolutely kind of I, that is a completely bonkers thought it's also very very shamanic because shamans have been in, and all of us who yeah. go into these spaces encounter these entities who aren't what they seem to be and you're like well you got to keep your wits about you because they say one thing oh but, yeah uh, you, you you can't tell so we're coming full circle in a yes lot of ways. yes yeah. and and i i 100 percent relate to that and i really in my own experience for whatever it's worth i think the trickster sage rules that realm and i mm -hmm. think he will come to you in every conceivable permutation and pull your strings and play with your emotions and send you down extraordinarily dark initiatory rabbit holes sometimes mm -hmm. that just seem torturous and like it's taking pleasure in tormenting you you know i'm sure you've had those experiences mm -hmm. i've had those experiences a mm -hmm. lot of times and it's and it seems nonsensical but then when you reemerge as alex with a with a functioning ego and you're i won't even project this onto you when you when you reemerge from one of those experiences Instead of me just feeding it to you, how do you feel? Um, yeah, I would say, well, it depends on the experience. Because one time I, I was a bit shaken, quite shaken. And then yeah. went through, that's what got me into shadow work, actually. Mm. 
really got me into shadow work and I'm so actually incredibly grateful for it. You know, other twistier, stranger, weirder times. Sometimes I feel a deep sense of inner humor, like the kind of cosmic smile, you know, and I'm probably invigorated at times. And yeah. And then, so it really depends, but this sense of the joke, not the joke even, but the, the humor at the core of, of reality is, is an experience I'll never forget. Yeah. 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 No, I, I completely, completely agree. And like, there's some, there's so many great riffs out there by so many luminaries. I actually posted a few of them, I think yesterday, all, all different musings about the sort of satirical or um, humorous nature of the human condition. Um, but like in, in difficult reemerging and reassembling from difficult experiences in particular, it's always just an unbelievable sense of relief that I get yeah. to be whole again, that I get to just not be tormented that, you know, that, that I, I have like control over my mental and bodily faculties to some, uh, much larger extent than, than I had just had. And there's, there's this innate lesson there of, you're overlooking this miracle, stupid. Like you're yeah, overlooking yeah, yeah. the miracle of consensus reality. And and that seems to be, and that's a joke in and of itself, right? It's like, oh, you want to come here? You want to see some pretty stuff? You want to get some knowledge? You want you want to connect with the, <laughs> the Senex archetype or something? Yeah. Like, how about this? How about I just drag you through like mud and thorns for, for six hours? Yeah. And then yeah. you're like, oh, never mind. This is pretty great. I, I, I guess I forgot about this. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, you, yeah. you know, what that reminds me of is, uh, in the Gnostic gospels, I believe it's in the Gnostic gospels, which, which I became really fascinated by, uh, some time ago. Yeah. Um, you know, Jesus says, um, you know, a version of like the kingdom of heaven is, is all around you. Uh, you just don't have eyes to see it, you know? And right, I was thinking right. about that and I was just imagining him saying that to like disciples and then being like, well, man, yeah, that's super deep. What, what do you mean? Like, you mean it's like metaphorically there? He's like, no, stupid. It's like, this is heaven. Like, this is like, you are, yeah. you are living it in, in this moment. But there is something about our own self, you know, something Bernardo Castro talks about as well. Like our, our self-deception of what's really going on in terms of reality. That's a real key repeated theme in a lot of spiritual traditions. Um, Gnosticism, it's in the Hinduism and in, in the sense of like, you know, God is constantly hiding from itself and we're all it, you know, and this is kind of twisty, turny, like forget who you are and then kind of re remember, then forget again. Um, so there's that, that there's something built in, I think, to human, to the human psyche where we will have these moments of revelation and be like, oh, we're all one. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I feel it. I'm connected to it, not just intellectually, but you absolutely feel it in every bone and every cell of your body. And then, uh, then you're working on an Excel spreadsheet and you forget right. about it. And you're like, oh, I'm just a dude who works in Excel spreadsheets. Right. <laughs> so yeah. It's really like, it's just built into us. It's built into us. But I think it's, um, I don't think we're sort of forever trapped. I think we can certainly stay, stay in a level of connection to something higher than ourselves. Um, even when we're, we're doing regular stuff. Yes. Yes. There's so many threads here. And so, so I feel like I'm, I'm living that meme of the of the fork in the road because there's <laughs> except ne except neither option is like the dark scary castle they're they're all just like glittering with uh, inviting imagery but I, I think one thing one one thread that seems obvious is to reflect on panpsychism the reemergence of the popularity of this idea through people like Kastrup like mm -hmm. that podcast you know like I'm new. I'm newer on YouTube than I am in the audio realm. So you know, I, I'm sure you remember the early days of trying to break through on YouTube and just mm. the, how much of a grind that is. And people like Castrop and people like Donald Hoffman, like people are just so eager to just drink, drink up that kind of wisdom because it's difficult to find really dyed in the wool geniuses who are willing to put their necks out there and say. Not only do I suspect that we live in a conscious universe, I think the preponderance of evidence clearly points to it. And I am not a dude who owns a retreat. I'm not a dude with, with <laughs> dreadlocks. I truly like am amongst the intellectual cream of the crop. And here is my mountain of 
rationale for thinking this way. And I myself am so drawn to that. And my own experiences and just suspicions and perhaps biases, I must, I must admit, lead me to a very similar suspicion that yeah. we do live in not a dead material reality, but one teeming with life, with consciousness, and that this archetypal realm that we've been talking about, these exper this ex psychical experiential realm we've been talking about is either a real place, real dimension, a a uh, connected dimension, something, and mm -hmm. that we only mm -hmm. think of it as, you know, the, like a less than because we haven't figured out a way to capture it. We haven't figured out a way to mathematically prove that it exists or do some kind of empirical magic with it yet until we, you know, can get in there and get the trans-dimensional hyper object out of that, 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 <laughs> that dimension and bring it back yeah, or whatever. Yeah. And, but... Meanwhile, everyone's swimming in that experience. Everyone's swimming in, you know, in, in qualia and in, in subjective experiences yes. of what it's like to do all of these amazing things that we do on a daily basis. Yeah. And it seems like a really common sort of um, journey that people's thinking takes is that they become disillusioned with whatever kind of cartoonish, simplistic version of religion they were fed as a child. They become either atheist or agnostic in a way where they're not mystically inclined. Then their minds get opened by certain ideas, certain molecules, and they realize, oh, actually, this is a lot more interesting than I initially gave it credit for. There's a lot more evidence for this than I initially gave it credit for. So I'm curious for you, I mean, I, I definitely know what parts of that journey must have been like for you. But how, how did you become interested in panpsychism, start to take the idea seriously, this this idea that we live in a in a conscious universe more seriously? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I think when I first got into psychedelics and meditation in like uh when I was like 19, I think I probably if you'd asked me that, I would have probably said, if you'd given me the options, I don't know if I would have known the word panpsychism, but um, I probably would have d sort of identified as that and had had some, yeah. some powerful mystical experiences and, and also, um, uh, yeah, would have, would have seen the world as alive and, and, and conscious and, and actually, um, speaking to us, not just kind of passively there. Um, and then I think, you know, through my twenties and it's, you know, I'm 36, I would say probably even into like kind of early thirties, I think I became kind of disconnected. I think I went through a few things that kind of shook my faith in the world I, I kind of just it was a difficult uh, my 20s were kind of difficult I was also trying to be a novelist and it wasn't really working and it's just, yeah. just like it was hard um and so I think I felt somewhat betrayed by reality and I had to go through the, the maturing process of like yeah getting over that that feeling and processing it and then by by the time of the the DMT extended state trial, which I, which I talk a little bit about in the book and uses a kind of narrative thread for some of this, mainly a big picture, but what's called the bigger picture, but it's mainly a kind of bigger mm -hmm. kind of topics like we're exploring here. But I, I included those because that, that the experience was totally completely wild and out there. And, and I had an experience in the final dosing where I had basically a kind of mystical experience I've never had before, which was an overview effect, which astronauts mm. talk about going to space and it came about because I was in this just utterly vast ecosystem of intelligences and having this dialogue with what I call like the teaching presence of the DMT, yeah. which is always a feature in, in all of my experiences, um, not just on DMT. And it was yeah. like, yeah, you're, you human beings are part of this. And it's like, un what the, the reason the whole thing blew open is because I had this entity encounter with these very friendly hyperdimensional chinchilla like creatures and it was so you know i almost was at the time thinking this is so mckenna ish that i almost wish yeah. it wasn't happening because, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. because they were speaking a visible language and i was speaking wow. i was sort of trying to speak it back and it was like i was imagining the symbols as best i could and they got very excited and like they could we could not understand each other at all like they wow. couldn't but the, you know and then after that there was a sort of giant squid-like entity that just did not, its energy could not have been more different. It didn't care I was there. Wow. It was just doing its thing. And I thought, huh, I wonder if it's like a different 
niche, like a species in a different niche in the ecosystem, and it does something else. And the, the, the DMT was like, yes, that's it. Like, that's exactly what's going on here. And then it was this whole moment of mm. feeling. Yeah. This was my, f- I've, I have to say, this was my favorite mystical experience, which is a ridiculous thing to say, but I'm just going to, I'm going to stick by it. So, because what it was, was feeling completely tiny in comparison to what else is out there. But also there was no sense of sort of ego I was still there. So there wasn't a sense of like ego dissolution in the sense of like melding to nothing, which, yeah, I, I think that's often misunderstood at least, or at least I don't fully understand it because who's watching the ego die as Alan Watts pointed out. Right. Like there's, a, there's a sense of yeah, some presence yeah, yeah. in that, which makes the whole languaging sort of nonsensical around it. But I was still me, but my ego was shrunk in the sense of like, it was so tiny compared to everything else. And that was okay. I was totally at peace with that. And I was like, that's, that's beautiful because I can be myself as much as I want. Um, but I don't, I don't have to sacrifice my self-expression in order to be connected. It's just that my self-expression is fucking tiny, right. like minusculely tiny compared to the rest of this. And that was a really deep experience. And then as I was writing the book, because I relate that experience, I was, I was my big, quest with the book was to figure out like or this is always my quest with with sense making and trying to figure out what's going on is like okay and and i'm you know really interested in systems change and in a lot of those communities it's like what's actually going to work like that's all i really care about i'm like yeah great we can all imagine utopias and it would be so fun wouldn't it be lovely if we all had held hands and sung kumbaya and yeah, everyone takes psychedelics, becomes enlightened, blah, blah, blah. It's like, it's all, it's all bullshit. Like, I don't think, I think the world's way more complex than that. Right. So I'm really fascinated by like, what is actually going to work? And that brought me to this place where I was like, the only thing I can think of is that we need new metaphysical foundations of first, because that's, that is like downstream from every, it's upstream rather from absolutely everything is what do we believe is real? And if we believe that only matter is real, we get the kind of culture we have now. If we believe that consciousness is also real, or the primary, as Castro would argue, because Castro is an idealist and he's really in the kind of there is just mind at large, there is just consciousness. Panpsychists are like there's matter and consciousness, and they're of one, right. like Spinoza said, they're of one substance. Mm-hmm. And I'm more of a panpsychist. Um, so I got really like I started really like thinking like oh shit, that as a foundational place from which to build our new systems is much richer. And I'm not the first person to think this by any means. Like um, Robert Piercy, who wrote Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. This was his insight. Mm. And that is the best-selling philosophy book of all time, right? And I think there's a reason for that. It's because I think it speaks to a lived experience that people have, that the quality of your experience is what's real. Yeah. And the, quant- the quantity of what you're ex- seeing and touching is is either, either as real or secondary to that. Right. And so he was like, so if you orient around quality, yes. you have a completely different outlook on life. And so it's also a problem in the psychedelic world because the, the research they select for is quantitative research, which right. is ridiculous as well, I have yeah. to say, because having been on a study, so much of that data, aside from the brain data, which is important, and it's on either or, but so much of the data was just me filling out questionnaires, sharing my quality the quality of my subjective experience, what it's like to be me, which can't be commented on by science. And then that information was quantified into trends or into patterns, which is a great exercise, super important. I'm not down on that. But what's arrogant about it is that it assumes that the original thing that they're actually measuring is of secondary importance to the quantity that they can get from it, which is totally, totally batshit crazy, right? Um, And then also looking at the brain imagery of when i'm on dmt and saying like oh yeah that's what's that's causing the experience is like looking at a boat going through the water and saying the wake is causing the boat to move forward right so we have like we have neural correlates of the experience and we have the experience itself so that really led me to like a my psychedelic experiences have really given me the lived sense that we are part of a living, thriving, intelligent universe. And that is just a really difficult yeah. thing to ignore or forget. I'm like, that's the real reason. I'm like, <laughs> because I've seen it. But of course, I can't just come back and be like, I've seen it. I've, I've been off the mountain and I've seen it. You know, like yeah. we have to come to some sense of uh, agreement as a collective, like to figure out like, you know, but I think we'll never be able to measure it through quantity. We'll have to measure it qualitatively, like the DMT mm-hmm. space and, and all yeah. these realms. Yeah. yeah, man, that really brings to mind how much we have battered and spat on the the importance 
of the qualitative. We, it, it's yeah. always relegated to the quantitative. Yeah. And, and I get that it needs to be, right? I get that we can't take everybody's experience equally because you don't know what yeah. kind of sense-making apparatus they're pouring that experience through. And, and like we said before, intuition often masquerades as bias. And yeah. also people just lie, man. People just fucking <laughs> lie to try to sell things, to try to yeah, elevate yeah, themselves. Yeah. And it's it's like an innate thing that, you know, as you really, truly, earnestly try to walk down this road of trying to sense make, of trying to figure things out, I think you become a little bit better, hopefully, at parsing information and thinking critically, but you can never fully trust what anyone says. But at the same yeah. time, it does not relegate the qualitative to being less than the quantitative. If, if you look at um, Plato's hierarchy of knowledge, for instance, he actually lays it out in four um, tiers. And the highest tier is direct knowledge of the forms. Mm, and the, the, the level below that is, is quantitative knowledge. Yeah. So like math, yeah. you know, like being able to observe capturable phenomena in the universe. And then, and then the problem is, is the first two forms of knowledge sound like perverted versions of knowledge of the forms because the first two forms are like essentially like hearsay and secondhand knowledge like well i heard i saw i felt mm. this so therefore it's true and it's like no 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 you're, you're confusing that low level knowledge for a high level knowledge is, is sort of something that i i feel like is going on a lot um Very but my 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 point being that the qualitative need is making i think some kind of a comeback through panpsychism and it's just it's so it, it's almost like the original sin not sin but neuroses or trauma is like learning to distrust our direct experience and then being coerced into devaluing our own direct experience and only only respect data only respect these uh foundational signed off on forms of knowledge that are accompanied by experiments and diplomas and whatever. And while all of that is beautiful, all of it's necessary, it's not all there is. And I think I think everybody intuitively feels that. And and they probably everybody listening to this wants to understand how to do the strange alchemy of combining those two ends of the spectrum. But it's like it's it's vapor man it's so hard to do to like yeah. truly understand what that means and and how to do it but i think just acknowledging that these things i mean we even call them secondary qualities right like a yeah. secondary quality yeah. of an apple is yeah. that it's red how it tastes you know all yeah. these things we can't we can't measure on a scale and it's like but really the secondary quality is why the apple is good you know like yes. and yeah, and yeah. that there's there's some it's also in a way the only thing you can be certain is real you know, that's an right. argument Castrop and, and a lot of idealists makes. Like the absolute, and Terrence McKenna used to say this too. Actually, like the the only thing you can absolutely say is for sure is you are having an experience yep. right now. Everything else is is secondary in that sense. Now, yeah, I mean, so it's interesting. Like to, to that to that point, um, you know, I'm really influenced by Ken Wilber and, and yeah. integral philosophy, and you know, he. I think you know he makes a really good point where we have these different domains of knowing. So we have the I the we, the it, and the its. And the the experience you have on a psychedelic is like the inside of the eye. It's like what it's like to be me, my experience. Now, somebody looking at me have that experience is somebody looking at the it. Like, okay, what's the actual, like what are the things that we can agree on collectively together? And for that, you absolutely need quantity rather than necessarily quality. It makes perfect sense. But, and if I want to agree on, like, you know, I'm even reading a book right now by, by uh, Peter Turchin, and he uses this uh, model of big data on history, like called mm -hmm. cleodynamics, where he looks at like trends and why, why societies have become fractured and then eventually had a revolution or fallen apart or whatever it might be. It's called cleodynamics. And it's like really interesting because it's like, yeah, actually history, when you look at it too subjectively, you can get really like thrown into different direct. A, you don't look, see the whole system. You think like it was individual people did shit which of course they did 
But if you zoom out and you look at the data, you will also see these like big trends that can actually help us predict what's happening. And Turchin has actually been really successful in, in predicting a bunch of not exactly what's going to happen, but like, yeah. you know, like, you know, certain levels of uh, social trends because they've just happened loads of times. So there's so much value to that. But the, the bigger problem, the big problem is that the whole ontological foundation of the culture is based on quantity. So then it's like, like you were just saying, like everything else is secondary. And so right. it's like, wait a minute, just because we need to use quantitative measurement and, and truth seeking in that way to agree on stuff together doesn't mean that all of reality is constructed based on that. Like exactly. that is crazy shit. That's crazy. Yeah. That's, that's just like really weak philosophy and not very scientific either. Um, but it is what we have. It's, yeah. it's the reductionism we have, partly because it's been so successful in making us have nice shit. Right, <laughs> We're like, right, hey, totally, computers, yeah. phones, yeah. amazing. And, you know, it's something to be said for that, for sure. But it's also unsustainable because it's if we don't return to quality, yeah. um, we are not going to survive, I think. Yeah. So we need to we need to make that shift. Yeah, man. Way. Yes. And the problem, too, is that quality, as, as I think you and I have both experienced, doesn't mean fun. No, there, there's this conflation <laughs> yeah. of like, oh, yeah. if it's quality, it must mean that I'm I'm comfortable. I'm good. I'm having a good time. It's like nah, sometimes what you need is a dose of richness and 90 yes. percent dark chocolate is not the most pleasant taste bud experience. But we know there's so much nutrition in there. We know there's <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Those, those, those flavanols, those antioxidants, what, whatever's yeah. going on in there. Yeah. And and experience is the same way, man. And and the problem is, is we've we're losing our ways to have those rich experiences that run the gamut. And again, this is why psychedelics are so important because yeah. they will give you that experience, whether you want to or not. And thank you for uh, for uh, putting this under the heading of science and education with you being a participant in this study because I can I can check that box now when I upload this video. But hey. <laughs> but um. And I, part of me is like, but are, are we ready for that? Are people ready for that with like this mainstreaming, this renaissance, this reemergence of these molecules into the zeitgeist and, you know, becoming easier to access in many cities where they've been decriminalized? Um, I, d of course I don't know, but mm. I, I also, but before we go there, I, I don't I don't want to leave out your participation in this study, actually, because it is so incredibly novel and I don't feel like we we really laid it out properly. And and um, if you've been watching or listening to the show, you you know about it because I had Andrew Gallimore on fairly recently. But it's this groundbreaking study at Imperial College London where they put people under extended state DMT intravenously. Um, the same way you would like in a surgery. And yeah. it's, to my knowledge, maybe it's not the first time it's ever been done, but it's the first time it's ever been studied in, in a yeah. capacity like this by a major university, for sure. And what's interesting is that I, I'm sure they were going after quantitative data because I don't think they could have sold this study in any other way. But I have to imagine there was immense interest in the qualitative aspect of what was going on. Um, so yeah, maybe if you don't mind once again, cause I'm sure you've told the story many times, but if you don't mind telling the, the story of how this happened, uh, anything I left out in terms of contextualizing the study and, yeah, yeah. and, and any other elements of your experience that you want to share, because I'm, I'm so immensely fascinated in this and that this is being done, uh, at a university and it sounds like it's an ongoing thing too. Yeah, I think I think they just about finished in, you know, June 2023. But yes, so no, you described it really well. And um, the so what I was on was the dose finding study. So I, I was one of nine people who were, I guess we were all fairly experienced psychonauts. Um, and we all were the guinea pigs for the guinea pigs, basically, because they were what they mm -hmm. were trying to find was the dosage that and this has already been published, the dose finding stuff trial. Um they were trying to find the right dose of continuously pumping in the DMT to keep us in a plateau of as intense as possible for as long as possible. So that involved a lot of sophisticated science because like, you know, your body metabolizes DMT very fast, which is why the experience is usually only like 10, 15 minutes. Um, so they had to figure out what speed do they pump it in so that it's faster than the metabolism. 
and also like how much there's a, a bull, bullus. I always mispronounce it, but there's a bullus, which is like they put in a bunch first, mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. it like there's something about like psychopharmacology that means that you need like a a lot more more first and then you taper it so there's also like how much they put in there so they got progressively stronger as well the dosings um and you know i signed up for it because i'm I'm friends with chris timmerman and now lisa luan who is also uh who's the phd student at the time um who was doing a lot of the day-to-day and really influential in, in the study coming about in the first place too so i i was just hanging out with chris and he was like um Oh yeah, we're doing this study, and I, I just like the, like your reaction describing it. I was like, "What? <laughs> doing what? <laughs> yeah, like, like that's a, what?" And I signed up for it like on the spot. I just said, "Well, I expressed my interest on the spot," and I really vividly remember walking away and um, thinking, oh, "I think maybe I've just made a terrible mistake. I think I might go yeah. back and say no." But but I was just really curious. That was my main overriding feeling, and it was also like post COVID. It was like the first time COVID was like properly like the restrictions are gone everything and mm-hmm. i also needed a bit of a, a reset like i'd like never even like been drinking too much alcohol i've been in that weird sort of covid just like partying a yeah, lot and just yeah, like yeah. working hard playing hard and so i also wanted a, a reset and i was i was thinking this is a deep initiatory experience and it's so out there so i'm going to prepare myself really intensely so they you know part of the rules for the trial were like no recreational drugs um and you were allowed to drink, but I was like, no, no, I'm just, um, I'm, I'm just going to go full, full health mode. And so then I also, I work with, um, kind of a really great facilitator coach, um, called Trish Blaine, who I've been working with for years. And I was like, Trish, she, she's, uh, has a, this kind of organization called non-ordinary hmm. and her experience is of uh kind of accessing non-ordinary states more spontaneously and then she also does a lot of group work and tantra so that was kind of great because she's not really psychedelic and i wanted someone actually also to work with who is, who's not going to have a whole bunch of pre presuppositions about dmt entities and whatever it might be yeah. so trisha was amazing to work with because we were basically training in like she was helping me prep like it felt like astronaut training she's kind of oh, helping wow. me prep like okay how am i gonna how am i gonna like mckenna used to say don't give way to amazement right yeah um in those first few minutes that was my and that was intense so when they injected in it was just like smoking dmt it was just like zero to a thousand in a moment and so the intensity was just really all i could do was breathe and kind of focus on my body and just wait for that initial intensity to pass and i would always um a bit like Strassman's volunteers you know i had these really consistent places i would go to i'd always start in the same place a sort of geometric cavern um, which was often overlaid with this image of this playground I had walked past like a few weeks before that I have no connection to. Oh, so weird. weird. This, this idea of like a nursery, you know, that you're kind of this, mm. like in this in the initial period. It's and like then I would burnt break in, through. a burnt in image on a television or something. Yeah. Like, I'm not yeah, sure how, exactly. how that that's got a, there. That's, but, that's yeah. precisely what, no, no, you, you picked up the image perfectly. That was what it was like. Um, and wow. then I'd always have this teaching presence of the DMT. And, you know, this was a big revelation for me. I have, you know, smoked DMT before that maybe five or six times and done maybe 40, 40 or 50 ayahuasca ceremonies, right? And so I had a sense of, I had an expectation that was completely flipped upside down Hmm. uh, because, you know, I was like, okay, hyperspace and entities, which did happen, but the DMT was this profoundly beautiful teacher. And like my first dosing was all about it. Uh, an unresolved issue in, in a deep relationship and how it affected my whole life. And like, it really was powerful. And what was so powerful about it, it was, it was like Terrence McKenna's idea. I, I kind of, as much as I love McKenna, I really rejected after this, the idea that the, the role of the psychonaut is to kind of like, just go past your biographical thing and go out into hyperspace mm. and bring something back. Mm. I'm still into the bring something back aspect of it. But I really think the division between biographical and metaphysical is is not a real division. I think you have to go through your stuff. You have to deal with your baggage. And that is deeply related to the metaphysical. That's what that's what my lesson was. I was like, it's not either or, it's it's both and. Yeah. Um so yeah, it was beautiful. And you know, the throughout the dosings there was a kind of theme of intimacy. I had this kind of theme that I was working on, or I, I mean I wasn't trying to work on it. It was working on me, like that was what I had to work on. And then the final dosing, which was, there was a gap. There was like a, a, what I thought would be the final dosing was in December. Hmm. And then I, and it was all, the book was also really interwoven with this because I was approached to write a book 
right after the trial ended. Wow. I was like, oh, maybe I wanted to write something like, you know, more sociological big picture. But I was like, maybe I could also like bring in these, I was, I was taking diary, really detailed diary entries the whole time. Thinking I would just put it on my sub stack at some point when the study was over because I was like, this is totally wild. I definitely want to write something about this. And so I pitched that as part of the book. Um, and there was, you know, the publisher was super into it. So, and then I was already writing the book and they got in touch again, Imperial. This is like March last year. And they said, Hey, we, do you want to come in for an extra dosing? Not just me, but I think all of us. And I was, mm-hmm. I was like, yes, I do. I definitely do. And I was all this mystery because they're scientists and they don't tell you shit. Like, <laughs> I was like, why are they doing this? And I, I suspected, and I was correct, that they had cracked the dose that they were trying to find mm-hmm. for the main study. And they wanted to give it to us to see, does it work? Right. And it was incredible. I mean, it was incredibly powerful. That's when I had that overview effect experience that yeah. I talked about before. Wow. So yeah, it was really beautiful. I really hope people end up having access to it in some capacity safely um, and consciously held because it is a really powerful teacher. That, and that was not expected. I didn't expect it. I think the only reason smoke DMT isn't like that is because you don't have time to get your wits about you mm. and figure out what's going on before it ends. Yeah, you're just stuck in you know, a whip. Fir- you just have whiplash the whole time. You get whiplash, exactly. By the time you're like, oh, shit, what's going on? Then it's kind of already tapering away. Yeah. Whereas this, you, we, yeah, we had that opportunity to kind of really ground into it and explore. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's probably not something you want to play with in an unsanctioned way no way that said there are these other kind of independent groups popping up that i'm i think you're probably aware of and that i actually talked to at the conference yes i I talked to them too (laughs) and i'm not and i'm not going to make i mean it seems like they're responsible and everything and they're doing everything right but i don't know but yeah anytime you're injecting something you're you're connecting an iv you want to you want to know you're 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 in good hands and everything's clean and everything but yeah it, 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 it might sound out there this idea of like, like come on, we're, we're not going to have, I, I guess we never even said that, that DMT is like considered by most people to be the er, tryptamine nucleus psychedelic molecule. Like it, it is, it is the, like the, the essence of that kind of an experience. Um, also incredibly closely related chemically to melatonin and probably endogenously produced. Well, we know it's endogenously produced. We know almost a hundred percent for certain that it comes out of the brain, but it has been shown in the brain of other mammals. So it probably is. That's probably enough necessary uh, Mm -hmm. contextualization, but it might sound out there, man, but we're doing it with ketamine. Like we're, we're blasting people into a visionary K hole for hours. Like why, (laughs) why not do DMT? You know, like exactly it's, and, and it's, and when I say that, it's like a FDA approved treatment for depression. So, and and I know many, many, many people who have done it in that setting. So it it seems possible, man. I, a lot of it, I think, is just changing people's ideas of what these things are. Because, you know, there's just so much baggage and so much um, propaganda wrapped up in the thinking. So it may take a generation of people, unfortunately, to die off. But... I think it's a foregone conclusion, man. I think novelty demands it. I think the trickster demands it. I think the zeitgeist demands it, that these things (laughs) will resurface and it only makes sense. It's like, it's like you can, you can already just, you just sociologically looking at the phenomenon, like unless a tremendous barrier comes down, um, it's, it's happening. Like all of this stuff yeah. is in motion. Yeah. There's tremendous financial interest in making it happen, which has yes. pluses and minuses, obviously. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, th- I think it is going to happen. And, and I think, again, its impact culturally is just impossible to, to predict or, or, or try to wrap your mind around at this point. And, and, and th- I guess it's coming full circle now because we're talking about in the beginning how these could be part of the catalyst for making like like being the difference maker at least in terms of altering altering the trajectory of sense making where yeah. I, you know it's and and i can see a skeptical person being like this is the fringes like no, like this is one percent of the population is going to want to do this if that but i was thinking about this the other day in the 1960s what percentage of people do you think were actually experimenting with tryptamines because i would exactly but look at the cultural, <clears throat> excuse me, but look at the cultural shift 
it was immense. You know, yes. there's like there's like yeah. some kind of weird psychic, like the zeit, the, the quality of the zeitgeist changes. Like there's this hundredth monkey effect on the zeitgeist or something like yeah. that when people start playing in these pools. And I can't see that not happening. Yeah, I, I don't Again, know how you feel about the it. The quality yeah. of the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's going to have an impact. I don't know what the impact will be and where, but I think it's going to be fairly significant. In, yeah, and you know, again goes back to quantity of people versus quality of transformative experience among That's right. certain people right yeah. because those people had an outsized impact and also you know eric davis when i mm -hmm. uh, interviewed him for the book he was i was like what was the impact of the 60s in his view he was like the impact was was switching a lot of people onto spirituality after yeah. that like meditation yoga and that's a pretty fundamental change in, in Western culture, you know, as well. You know, now you look, there's like a Lululemon on every right. corner or whatever. You know, unfortunately, the whole capture of those practices by the, the system is right. something I, that's the next chapter. If you're on chapter three at the moment, that's uh, chapter four in the book. I talk about the dark side and, and mm -hmm. capture. But yeah, I mean, I think it's it's going to be, it's going to be mixed. There's going to be, People accessing, I think it probably will be a lot of early, right now where I think we're in this kind of early adopter phase, oh, yeah. Yeah. right? And so it's growing. Uh, my, my great hope and what I want to try and contribute to is that people have adequate education around how to yeah. trip, how to be a psychonaut, right? Because that's what I got. I'm sure you had a similar kind of process of like, you, you know, there were people, it was like almost like joining a a crew online like i was on an internet forum in, yeah. in like um uh so 2007 or so i joined it um and i learned so much like i actually just would we would argue philosophy and, and right. ego death and right. like it was beautiful it was really formative for me and there was arrowid you know there mm -hmm. was like these kind of very underground educational processes now there's a lot more but i also think and, and that's a good thing i think people need proper education we need to like normalize how to how to be a safe psychonaut because people will right. be accessing them outside of contained settings as well and that's just inevitable so i think mm -hmm. there's a kind of not just harm reduction but but deepening of the experience and yeah. also we need to i think use the experience creatively you know combine it with conflict resolution like we were roseman and sami awad have done with groups of israelis and palestinians drinking ayahuasca together for conflict resolution you know combine it with creativity enhancement, combine it with systems change, like um, workshops, and actually start, but, but to do all these things, you need a competence and uh, you need to yes. be, have a sense of connectedness mm -hmm. to yourself enough. You need to have worked through enough to be able to participate in that kind of thing. Yeah. So there's a whole deep protocol and process, not just one, but many of people working together and innovating to be like, because imagine if someone creates a conflict resolution process, which has like a 90% effectiveness rate because it combines tried and tested conflict resolution with say MDMA or a different psychedelic, that would be fucking incredible because right. you don't need to give it to everyone. You just need to give it to the main players in particular conflicts if they're open to it. And then it's not going to magically change the system they're part of, but it it's a really good step. It's a really good addition. A hundred percent. So yeah. A hundred percent. And I think too, like, you know, we're, we're starting to like meander into the like tempering, part of the conversation i feel like because we are bo both so like generally enthusiastic about <laughs> yeah. the possibilities and what could be on the horizon and you know what it makes me think of is that there's always this lore attached to any kind of mysticism or occult practice or esoteric thing that if you're not ready it's going to make you crazy if you penetrate into the mysteries without <laughs> like the necessary <laughs> philosophy it's going to make you crazy and, and while i don't take that severe of a reading, I think the same metaphor pertains because you need to do the requisite work of, you know, yeah. whatever you want to call it, building a philosophical foundation, sense making, whatever, before approaching these realms, I think, because otherwise the consequences are not, I, I don't think they're going to be a hundred percent negative, but it, you know, it can lead to ego inflation. It can lead to this phenomenon uh, Jung would talk about called, um, I don't remember exactly what he called it, but he talked about how when you have what he called an experience of the mana personality, 
there's a possibility that it will actually result in ego inflation. And what the mana personality yeah. is, yeah. is this thing, this giant entity in the unconscious that appears to be like this transcendent consciousness. And if you encounter that thing unprepared, you may think you're the special one now. You you, yeah. you may come out of the experience thinking I've been chosen. I like I, I've you know I I've been anointed by like some transcendent being to do this or that. And we've all seen that happen with with yeah, these communities. Yeah, yeah totally. Like, People time and time again. Yeah, confusing yourself with the archetype in a way, right? Like it's like yeah, totally. That and that is. I mean, this is so crucial because it's such a it's you know uh, Osman said to fathom hell or soar angelic just take a pinch of psychedelic like <laughs> fathom hell is as important like delusion disassociation yeah. you know i've known people who who have not survived psychedelic experiences and that they they just you know they killed themselves wow. you know, because they had such a horrible experience wow. in that case because they were interrupted by paramedics so that's a, the worst thing that can happen is if someone is going through a kind of spiritual crisis and they get sedated at that moment it's the worst thing really? that I've seen yeah, happen because uh -huh. they don't get to psychically resolve it. And then there's that makes stated. sense. So it's an extreme example, but you know, it's important because they are like psycho spiritual skydiving. You know, mm -hmm. you get to see much more. It's fucking exciting. It's yeah. invigorating. It probably change your perspective forever, but it's dangerous too. Yes. And they're effective because they're dangerous. Yes. Right. As, as most things are right. So in that sense, like great reverence, as we all know, if we're in the psychedelic world, you know, and, and especially if, if like me, you've been burned in the past and had a bad experience and mm -hmm. like, uh, they, they do happen very f transformative experience though, I would say as well. Um, but the, this, um, yeah, the, the process of actually like doing the inner work required to be able to, which you can do with the help of psychedelics very much so, but you can't just do it with psychedelics. You also need to do relational work. You need to do work of like, okay, because so many of our woundings and our hangups, we can't see ourselves. We need someone else to kind of reflect them to us in some way. So, you know, that's why I really love group work and, you know, therapy and, you know, meditation is a really important practice to me, although I'm kind of dipping and out of it. Um, having been a much more avid meditator breath work it's what john verveke calls an ecology of practices yeah, 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 because yeah. no no single practice just does everything like meditation doesn't really help you do shadow work it doesn't really deal with the shadow that effectively so you need to do shadow work but shadow work won't help you expand your sense of being able to um you know take a step back from the content of your experience and then observe it in a different way so you need you know ideally we need a whole bunch of different practices together um, it's kind of a tall order in a way, but it's worth it, I think. And if our schooling was different, we would teach us some of those practices in school. One hundred percent, man. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know, I know, we've been going a while, but you brought up shadow work, and I would love to talk to you about that. Yeah, do, yeah, I'd be do, happy to. Do, do you want to go oh, there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so that's my by far biggest transmission ever is my is my shadow work video, and people's interest. So people's interest in that topic is clearly there, and my videos, you know not the only one. There are many other videos that have like millions and millions of views on this topic. And I think there's a couple different built-in sources of interest for this topic. One is just innately mysterious and cool sounding and everyone. So this is another thing that mask can masquerade like a motherfucker, just people mm -hmm. thinking they're doing shadow work and really they're just doing something to buttress their ego further. Yeah. But my my exploration of it was pretty, you know, surface level in terms of like, what did Jung mean? What what did you know? What really is it? Where does it come from? Um, and then I did start to discuss ways to do shadow work, but as a non trained, you know, I'm not. I don't come from a. I don't have Jungian training. I'm not an analyst. Um, I talk about what these things are and a little bit about how to do them. But I don't go super deep. So I'm very curious for you as a very thoughtful, multifaceted person with an ecology of practices and a pretty, pretty strong philosophical background. How do you understand it and how do you approach it? Yeah. So, I mean, it, you know, my most transformative psychedelic experience ever was, was, is what led me to shadow work or because of it, I went to shadow work. And it was actually this experience of, um, intense, sadistic, violent wow. entity 
you know, kind yeah. of crushing my soul and you know, my chest physically yeah. and threatening to kill me. And I was like, holy shit, what's going on? It was in Peru. And then I asked the shaman. And, <laughs> Sorry, and she I'm was just like, laughing because that's like know, every time, every, <laughs> every ayahuasca experience I've had has basically also been that. So it's, I had to laugh. It's, like, yeah. dark, bro. Right. They, it's a dark place. Iquitos is a dark place. I think it'd be an incredible setting for a murder, like a film noir murder oh, God. mystery. Yeah. I'd love to see that. But yeah, so. Um, so I asked the shaman, uh, and she was like, no, that, that wasn't the medicine that was you. And I was like, I was such a hip, I was such a new age love and light guy. And, you know, I was like early 20, in my early twenties. And I was like, me never. And then I encountered, um, integral and integral has a great model for shadow work, which mm. I really think is incredible called the three, two, one method where, you know, Jung talked about basically like, you know, the shadow is, you know, my, I have a friend, Doshin Roshi, he's a Zen master. He's known as the shadow Roshi, you know, because mm. he does shadow work and combine it with Rinzai Zen. It's amazing. Interesting. And he calls the shadow the me I can't see, wow. which is, I think is wonderful, right? It's like, the, it's, it's that aspect of yourself that you cannot see. So if you, right. and he's really big on this. He's like, if you think you're doing shadow work and you're looking at something you're aware of, yep. it's not really shadow work. If you've become aware of it and it was out of uh, out of consciousness and out of then a shadow. And also in my experience, the shadow, encountering the shadow is agonizing at first because it's an it. The, it's an it. So the three, two, one method is there's first the shadow is an, out there. It's an it. It's not me. And then, of course, it gets projected onto other people. So, you know, if I say I'm not angry, anger is an it, um, then uh I see anger in other people. The world seems angry to me, yeah, right? So, yeah. and then also, you know, if I get cut off in traffic, it, I, I, or I get drunk or something, I lose my center and I just fly into a rage, right? Because it's not, I, it has me, I don't have it. Um, and then the, the three, two, one method is then to make it a second person. So you can do this in like a visualization mm -hmm. where I do it, I used to do it in our men's, men's retreats where we do it like a guided visualization down to the cave because a lot of men have a shadow around not wanting to be like those guys, like those kind of like macho dude yeah, assholes. Like, true. so they cut off from their life force energy. We do that as men. Sometimes we cut off from an energy of like, I don't want to have any of that aggression. I'm going to be a nice guy. I don't want to like tap into that because the confusion is that that energy will take you over. And of course it's, it's sadly the opposite way. It's that it takes you over if you don't tap into it. Right. And so we, the three to one process, you know, you go into like a cave and effectively I would always encourage, um, I would say to men, okay, imagine a guy walks onto the train. You're sitting on a train and a guy walks on and you just fucking hate him. You hate him. You've never spoken to him. He just disgusts you. You're like, what the fuck is wrong with that guy? You know, you have to follow your disgust and this visceral sense of, ugh. um, and then identify the quality. What is it about him? And then say a guy might be like, oh, he's arrogant. I was like, okay, what if I were to say to you, you're, you're kind of arrogant. Yeah. You'd be like, Okay, does it trigger the shit out of you if you hear right, that? Right, right. Okay, that's probably a, a good. There's a lot of nuance around this. I'm I'm glossing over, but that then that's probably a good place to start looking for some shadow material. And then in the cave visualization, you bring that guy to mind and you talk to him and you ask him questions like, "What do you want? Like, what makes you happy? Like, what do you think about me?" And then you have this dialogue. And the the, the last stage is when the shadow becomes me. It's like, holy shit, I'm talking to myself. That is Beautiful. me. I have this quality within me. And that is when Anne Shulgin, the, the great psychedelic um, therapist, uh, she said the shadow then becomes like a not quite housebroken pet, <laughs> like a wolf on a chain, Love right? That. It's Love sort of that. like, it's always got a wildness to it. It's always got like a kind of slight sense of danger to it. And you have to, you don't necessarily, in my view, tame the shadow you become an ally with it and you give it great respect. And in that way, then converse, it, it conveys upon you like an enormous amount of life force energy that you were cut off from. Yes. So it's a yes. beautiful process. And it is for me the most powerful ongoing process. Every time I think I'm like, yeah, I've got that under control. I get slapped in the face <laughs> and I'm like, oh shit. No, that's not the way this work is. The work is to hold it as as often as possible i make a conscious choice about where am i going to act yeah. from but you can't make that conscious choice if it's if it's got you so yeah that's my very brief take on that. shadow work i love uh, that yeah yeah and that that really echoes one of the things i said which is like 
I didn't use the train example of talking to this person that really puts you off, but that's a great metaphor for the the way that I entered into the conversation too, which is like, do you earnestly want to have that conversation with that part of yourself that makes you disgusted? Because everyone loves the idea of it, right? Of being integrated, being more awake, being more complete, individuated. And but the actual is like, no, do you you gotta understand that this is like the equivalent of like cleaning the dirtiest part of your taint. Like, you know, it's like <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. But it also can be, you know, like as everyone points out, is like there's there's tre the that's also where the treasure is. That's also where the undiscovered strength is and all of that stuff. But, yeah, yeah. but it's like, no, don't, don't make a mistake. How hard is the treasure to find? You got to usually go through the dragon. You got to usually go through the labyrinth and fight all the fucking orcs and like, yeah, you know, yeah. so, so yeah, there, that's, that's a great example of like how people want to bypass the shadow. Work. It's also got treasure. It's like, yeah, it does have yeah. treasure after you've had your head smashed against the wall and you go through yes. the whole hero's journey of being resurrected and dark night of the soul and all of that shit. But, um, yeah. but yeah, man, that, that's a great, that's a great method. I'm, I'm glad I, I'm glad we went there. Final thing yeah. that I just want to, I just want to throw your way because yeah. we're, we're way okay. past it now, but it really reminded me of something specific is when, when you were talking about this essential, essentially like, almost what sounds like a soul flight type of experience that you went through in the yeah. study where you were like ascending through these spheres of consciousness and activity. D you said it felt kind of sci-fi and this particularly triggered tr triggered. What is that? That's a new, that's a, that's a less, a less, gonna, uh, a work. less offensive triggering. It's like a, it's like a wiggle, a wiggle, a, wig like a mini trigger, a wiggly trigger. Um, <laughs> this, this story I heard from, have you heard of Plutarch, the middle Platonist? Uh, I have heard the name Plutarch. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so he's primarily known as like this great biographer and he wrote like, uh, you, this huge body of work called lives where he like profiled all these people from the yes. ancient world. And that's primarily what he's known for. But he was also like the other Platonists, a mystic and ha collected these other stories. And one of the stories he tells, and of course he's, you know, it's like probably a mixture of potentially based on something real, but then also trying to put esoteric wisdom into the story. And one of them is essentially like this near death experience of this ne'er do well. Get this right. He goes to a um, an an oracle, and uh. or or th an oracle is involved, and she says something cryptic like, "He'll become a better person in death," or something like that because this guy was just such a piece of shit and so he has a traumatic accident like falls on his neck just breaks his neck whatever and then he proceeds to have this soul flight experience where he's essentially having this i don't know how to describe it but he's like ascending through both actual things like the atmosphere of the earth and outer mm -hmm. space, but he's seeing it all teeming with these different archetypal life for forms and mm -hmm. gods and, and like the Sybil on the moon and all of these things, like suddenly all of these things are like coming to life and he's experiencing them. And the thing that's really interesting is he's curious throughout it. And he's like asking questions just like you were of like, what, like, what is this? What, how do I communicate with this? And the presence, the teaching presence is his daimon in the story. Uh, okay. And his daimon is like, oh, you want me to explain it? I'll explain it to you. These are this, this is this, this relates to this in this way. Wow. And, and, and then what's really interesting for me as like a, a trickster hermetic uh, weirdo is that his <laughs> daimon becomes Hermes in this and it goes from being the daimon to hermes and that connects back with jung it connects back with a lot of different things but um and it also just makes me curious about the quality of these beings that the greeks called the daimon because maybe there's mm -hmm. some kind of weird archetypal connection between the daimon and this hermes archetype because they're both like threshold beings you know um like hermes is yeah. the god that dwells on the threshold and the daimon is supposed to be like your threshold guardian being but oh, but yeah yeah man. that that experience really made me think of that plutarch story and then so it wound up being a near-death experience and this guy basically in the 
the in-between stage basically downloaded a whole new personality and became a way nicer person after he came back. So that was sort of like the the Oracle's, um, you know, prediction coming true, essentially. Wow. Shit. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. I have to go and read that because that's try to so strikingly similar to um the phenomenology of it is really yeah. similar to my my and, and i think other people's dmt x experiences and you know also um i do in the last dosing i did start questioning the teaching presence mm. because i had this sense that it i had this sense that it was more than one something and it gave me this answer which was like i was like what are you and it was like it said you but not you we but not we and i was like huh Okay, it's really cryptic, but also mm. like naturally trickstery, right? Yes, yes. And so there's something about the identity of it which became really interesting, and this morphing of identity from from the the, the daemon into into Hermes, which is a messenger to the gods, right? I, among many other things, yeah. Among, among many, many other things, things yeah. yeah. Hermetic, yeah. So so that's fascinating, man. Like, yeah, that, that's um beautiful. I'm glad that we've we've ended on on the ancient world as well, and on that wisdom because I I. Uh, yeah, I also think that that could well play a role in, you know, hopefully a deeper ontology in the West is is going back to our native roots in that sense to kind of, yeah. um, instead of trying to take it from other cultures um, who've developed their own, we're like, no, no, we're like totally. going to our mythic, mythic roots that because we've got plenty of them. And, you know, I don't know if you know Peter Kingsley, but he's one mm-hmm. of the, the, you know, one of the, the main thinkers in that area so yeah yeah interesting very interesting yeah we're, we're ending on a note of aporia which is all, always like a seems like a great place then because now we're on to a mystery that there's no fucking way we're even going to scratch the surface of <laughs> yeah. um and that's my favorite type of of dialogue to have my friend so i greatly greatly enjoyed this i would love to do it love again this. um yes. and, and thanks for Me coming too, on man. man yeah thank you this is a real pleasure